welcome to GCU. I'm Emily Spivak, the author of Born Stories. I'm Maxine Beda from Zadie, speaking at GCU's town hall event about slow fashion. Hi everyone, I'm Maxine Beda, the uh, co-founder and CEO of Zadie. We are a shopping and lifestyle destination for the conscious consumer. Uh, and since uh, past November, we've started our own line of clothing that's working from the farm all the way through to final production, uh, developing products that have the user in mind that are meant to last using really high quality materials and, and telling the story of every step in the process and, and building that connection between the producers and the consumers. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Emily Spivak. I wrote the book Worn Stories. It originated as a website where I was collecting stories that people would share with me about a garment that had some significance to them. Um, anyone from Marina Abramovich to Albert Mazels to David Carr to Greta Gerwig to someone who was kidnapped in something they were wearing or someone who was stabbed in something they were wearing, but thinking about how we connect to our clothing. Prior to that, um, I had the only fashion history blog for the Smithsonian, um, and prior to that, and, and in conjunction with that, was doing a project called Sentimental Value, where I would collect stories I'd find on eBay when people were selling clothes, and they'd talk about what they did while they're wearing the clothes and while, why they're getting rid of them, and I would exhibit the garments and. Some of the 600 stories I collected over the years started that in 2007. For me, slow fashion comes from thinking about the provenance, the memories associated with it, with a piece of clothing, and just generally like a thoughtfulness associated with the things that we have in our possession. So I was curious to know a little bit more. I'm coming very much from the personal side and the storytelling side and asking people, individual people, to share their stories. They're not framed in a slow fashion context. But I'm curious how Zadie defines slow fashion and how you are thinking about it, the context of your work. Well, I think it was also from a very personal perspective. And, you know, I didn't come from this with, you know, this idea of, you know, like, we need to have slow fashion. It was, I grew up with fast fashion, and I remember when the first fast fashion companies um, came to America and was very excited about it. Uh, and that was kind of the, you know, I, I was that generation where it shifted from clothing costing quite a bit of money to not having to think about it. But then I also lived in New York, and I didn't have a big closet. Um, and so I kept having just this small closet with clothing coming out, and I said, how do I have all this stuff and never anything to wear? What is, what's happening here? And it was at, you know, at that stage, and then I went off and I was, I was working in, uh, as a lawyer in um, Tanzania, and I went and I found this beautiful basket, and I went to go track down the town that it was made in so that I could get a bunch of these baskets, and I had visions of bringing them back with me to New York and putting them on my wall. And I arrived at this little town, and I never forget it. it. On the left side of this village, it was like all dried fish stalls. And on the right side, it was like Basket City. And I thought, what does dried fish and baskets have to do with one another? And so I went um, you know, behind, and it, the, the town was on the banks of a river. And I saw that these baskets were made from reeds that grew by the river. And that's why you'd have a town that's known for dried fish and baskets. And I then got to see how these people, you know, using their hands, had this amazing design in their head that they then translated with, like, you know, just this amazing work. And I couldn't get that thought out of the back of my head. First, that I didn't realize, you know, baskets, like, don't come from Target, um, they come from a place. But then also um, that you know, there are people that are making them and there's this process behind it. 
And I, you know, once you know something, it's, it's just hard to unknow it. And so I had, I just kind of brought that lens to everything and I wanted to know like, how are my jeans made and how was my computer made and how is everything made? Um, and so that was when kind of my first sort of foray into thinking about these things. And then I, I also remember, you know, dealing with my closet issues and trying to like solve like, <laughs> what do I actually want to wear out of this? And then thinking, what do I actually end up just going back to? And how about I sort out my closet that way? And let me learn what, what are those, what is it about it? And so I looked at the tags and I actually saw what it was and they were all natural fibers. The things that I ended up wearing, I learned from looking at the tags were natural. And so that was kind of the beginnings of this idea that I you know, later saw was slow fashion. So can you take me through an example of one of the pieces um, that's on the Zadie site right now and how you figured out that you wanted to actually put that on the site? It started out, and I'm sure in this room everybody knows what that, like, the fashion trade shows look like, not the runway shows, the trade shows. And we started there and we very innocently um, just went kind of aisle by aisle by every, I think it's like five miles, and asked every um, company there, um, excuse me, uh, where do you do your production? Can we learn a little bit about that? Uh, and the answers that we got back in that process um, shouldn't have been surprising, but still were, nevertheless. Uh, you know, there's just kind of a lot of blank looks and, um, you know, vague responses like Asia, um, people said the Orient, which I thought was incredibly backwards. Um, and I thought, you know, to me it was just showing, wow, we really like have a ways to go in the fashion industry. But then there was, you know, one in maybe every 100 companies would kind of light up and was so excited and surprised that we even asked that question and then would dive in and kind of go into every detail and, you know, was enthralled and, um, and that was how it started. And then it became this network, you know, in, in any sort of, like GCU, it becomes this sort of um, network of like-minded companies um, that are on the same mission together. Um, and so that is really how it started. And, we really just focused on the brands that are very close to their production. So that, you know, it's either in the backyard or it's, you know, in the, in the same area. And that for us, as we kind of explored what the issue is, is the disconnect that's happened in the fashion industry between when, where things are designed and where things are produced. So that's how, you know, that's how that piece got started. And then, you know, as we dug into it deeper, we saw, you know, there, Knowing where the cut and sew takes place is very important and, and tackles a lot of the issues. But we also need to know the processes before that. Um, and so we decided with our own line to really use that as a showcase of what's possible, of saying, you know, you, you can figure out what that farm is. And it was us going the kind of exact opposite way of how design is done, where we first found the organic farms and ranches and then worked our way backwards. So saying, you know, who are you working with? Because if you start the other way, nobody wants to tell you, um, you know, that's like their secret sauce. And so that was kind of how we managed to build it out is uh, speaking to the farmers and the ranchers and working our way through. And then a lot of it is just building those relationships and kind of bringing, I always talk about like bringing people along so that they understand we're not just this fashion company, what it is that we're trying to do and that each part of the supply chain, they're really partners in the whole thing. Is it possible to, to change the business models for, you know, for a more established company? I do think it's possible, um, and it's going to require a lot of coordination. And so it's great that we're in this room today, um, because it's going to mean that the industry has to, I think, first just talk about the elephants in the room, um, talk about the problems and challenges, and not be, not be nervous about that piece of it, because it's only once we really get that you know, beyond those major issues um, that we can start coordinating with solutions because, you know, I'll take, 
like a factory, for example, a lot of times, you know, a brand will say, we want to do the right thing, but then we're paying for an upgrade of a factory that every other brand is going to be using. Like, why is that our responsibility? Well, if there's coordination on that and everybody's on the same page and, and moving in lockstep, then, you know, people can share that cost amongst the companies. Frequently, sustainability and CSR are kind of segmented yeah. and they're not incorporated into the business plan or they're not uh, incorporated into the, the business model. And I think that as much as we can begin to incorporate those elements so that a business, the CSR, you know, the, the, the chief sustainability officer isn't cordoned yeah. off, um, but is able to say, well, this is where the, the, um, the business value is yeah. and this is where, you know, we only have so many, so many resources, so if we plan now, we're actually going to be ahead. Yeah. Um, I think, unfortunately, it's, it doesn't necessarily just come from the goodness of people's heart, yeah. but it, yeah. it also comes from examples of, well, this is, this is the business case for this. Yeah, and I, and I think that's such a great point. Um, and, and that's where consumers really have a, a big role to play in that, um, is that and that's what I've learned from this process is how powerful consumers are because the consumer in showing that they care is empowering the CSR team to say to their leadership, this is what, you know, and, and the millennial generation is actually great for that because they really do care um, and they are voting with their dollars. So it just continues to build a business case, not just for sustainability being in the long term for the environment and for social impact, um, but also to just get the interest of the next generation of consumers. If we talk about uh, what's being sold on your site and terms like eco fashion, green, uh, sustainability, sustainable, um, slow fashion, I mean, they're, they're thrown around. Yeah. How do you determine? how we align all these definitions and how we align all of these metrics so that they're, the consumer doesn't have to do all the work, but that it's very clear that this is, you know, this is sustainable, this is sustainable and this means X, yep. you know, and this is for these reasons. What we're really trying to do is talk about facts and, you know, people can spend as much time or as little time on the site, but if they want to really invest the time, they can learn about soil use, they can learn about water use, they can learn about um, what dyes are harmful and what dyes are, are less harmful and have lower impact. And so that's really you know, how we have to, to build things up is to just remove kind of the clutter of the terminology and speak to the facts. Um, and when we do talk about a term, we, we you know, sustainable is one word that we use, uh, but we define it. Um, and we don't define it in a vacuum. We use what the UN uses for sustainability, which to us just made the most sense. Not because it was the UN, but it's talking about economic sustainability, which is in order for us to survive, we have to make money. Um, it talks about social sustainability, that in order to have a workforce, you have to pay them a living wage. And it talks about environmental sustainability, which is in order to have any of those two things, you have to have a planet to live on. Um, and so that's, I think there's a, a lot that the industry has to do in clarifying what those things are, being on the same page about it. Um, and so that's kind of, that's really what we're, we're focused on on that side. And then in terms of how we do our vetting, what we're really focused on, especially not especially, for the, the other brands that we carry on the site, we don't want to pretend to say, this is perfectly sustainable. Um, because it's, there isn't a 100% sustainable thing. We're making clothes, we're not planting trees. Um, but what we're trying to do is highlight and be transparent with what for each product is making that particularly special. Is it that there's local production? Is it that it's um, using a uh, particularly low impact material and what is that exactly? And so that's what, what we're trying to do with that is to say let's celebrate steps towards it 
um, and then with our own product really to say this is, this is what's possible. Um, but then even with our own product, um, highlighting where we're not there yet. Because that, I think, that's is the challenge. You know, that's, um, and, and I, I look at Patagonia in this, and I really just have so much respect for what they're doing is when they do something wrong or, or find out that something in their supply chain isn't great, they have highlighted it and, and re accept responsibility for that. Um, and I think that's kind of the approach that all brands have to have is to be a little less scared of saying, well, I have to have this like CSR initiative and show that off, but that we together, you know, as an industry are going to have to make some big steps and that the consumer appreciates, you know, the steps along the way and, and they'll be there and they will be okay um, knowing that it's, you know, it's not 100% yet. So someone asks, uh, what are the best sources a consumer can review to select better brands? Um, so in addition to Zadie, because um, how, how can we become better consumers and what are some other resources that you would recommend? I think, so my kind of always first step in when asked that question is buy things you love. That alone, even if you like, even if it's not the best fabric, if you are focusing on buying things that you love, and I think that gets back you know, to the philosophy that comes out in the book, um, cuts down on the waste, which is one of the biggest issues. And then starting to look at the tags. What is the material? Where, does, where is the country of origin? Even knowing that that name or that country isn't representative of the whole supply chain, which is a whole other problem, but um, first just kind of beginning to just be aware, what material is this? Is it a natural material? Okay, if it's a natural material, um, is it organic or what does that mean? Um, do I know more about the supply chain? And that can be, you know, I think, I think that's where we have to start and then we can kind of build from that as to what, you know, what brands are doing it and things like that. Um, I'm going rogue for a second. I'm just asking a question because it makes me think about are there things that you did as you were starting this because this is a very entrepreneurial endeavor? Um, you know, any sort of failures that from which you, you grew and, and things that you assumed about people's behaviors around buying or, you know, thinking like you said that you were going to, you know, be able to source things from all over the place and then having to refine that, where there, you had to refine those. I think, you know, make changes. we've kind of evolved, as we've evolved as a company, um, how we communicate what the issues are. And I think in the beginning, um, you know, we talked about heritage and that, that story. And as we were going along, it was like, that, we're, this is fashion and fashion is the future and I think that's what makes fashion so exciting is it's you know what we're gonna dress like and be like and and that's you know fashion at the heart is envisioning this future and it you know if you actually look back about fashion and how they thought you know we would dress it's totally off right um, like we've kind of gone athleisure instead of like future spacesuits um, but it's that dreaming and it's that thinking about it that, um, that is so exciting. And so that kind of that turn was really empowering for us where we talked about re-envisioning the future of fashion um, and seeing it as something future forward that still understood the past and appreciated that history and found that to be really interesting. Um, but I would say that was a, a learning moment for us or just it felt very natural and organic. Um, but a very empowering kind of approach is we're, we're thinking about how are we going to address people in 2050? How right. is, what is that world going to look like? How, how are we as an industry going to figure that out? Um, versus just kind of, this is how it's always been done, so this right. is what it should be. Well, thank you very much to both of you thank for being you. with us and giving us such great things to think about. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> Fashion industry statistic 
is that Americans, on average, buy 70 new pieces of clothing every year. One of the most memorable fashion statistics is that we, as individuals, get rid of 68 pounds of clothing every year.